my name is Jim O'Donnell, not Buck Nye, as my little uh, screen shows there. Um, you know, Buck is uh, logged on, but let me uh, run this uh, webinar. I uh, appreciate you all uh, taking the time once again to uh, come with us, meet with us, and uh, listen to uh, some engineering topics that we uh, put on periodically. Um, just today, we're going to go over indoor air quality. We're going to provide some updates. We're going to focus on air ionization. Um, we have Larry Botello uh, from GPS Air. That's our speaker there. He's uh, Vice President of Sales in the Northeast. And then just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. So um, down at the bottom, you can see that there's a, a question and answer. You can type in your questions. We will monitor them. Uh, the intent is to uh, keep those until the end. If there is something pressing, we will interrupt Larry to have him uh, speak or, or answer those just to, for clarification. And then just um, we will provide a, a question and answer uh, period. We'll, uh, we, we're recording this webinar. We'll clean it up and send it out afterwards. Uh, before you log off, there's a survey. We ask that you can fill it out with some uh, generic questions uh, that will help us in the future to, uh, um, you know, for other topics and how we did on this one with clarifications and such like that. Um, we can issue uh, PDH credits. Um, just want to make sure you're aware that uh, Larry and GPS Air can provide uh, CEU credits. If you're so interested in them, uh, please uh, contact me and send an email. All right. So um, without further ado, let's uh, get started on our presentation. The first thing we're going to try to do is to uh, play a, a video of uh, GPS. So Larry, can you see that? Uh, no. Okay. You're likely familiar with the way filters work in most heating and ventilation systems, whether it's at work. Share your screen. Yeah, let me try this one again. Of course, we did this yesterday and it worked, and now I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> if you have the uh, if you have it open, uh, minimize okay, it to yeah, the share bottom. Screen. Share your screen and then share that window. The reason we're doing it this way, for some reason, through mine, the audio wasn't working. Uh, sorry, where is it again, Larry? Um, well, if you have the if you have the video on your screen that you can see it, yeah. just minimize it so it's at the bottom. Then share your screen, and then you'll have the option as to which window to share. When you click on share my screen, and uh, okay. yeah, yeah, my bad. Oh yeah, how embarrassing. Okay, here we go. All right. Let's get there started. You go. Here you go. Yay. Work, home, school, or even play. Filters perform a critical role, capturing and removing airborne particles from indoor spaces where life happens. But not all filters are created equally. That's why they are tested to what is known as Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value, or MERV. The higher the MERV rating, the better the performance. All filters have a varying degree of efficacy capturing large particles like dust and dander. But even the highest MERV rated filters have a pronounced weak spot when it comes to very small particles less than one micron in diameter. The MERV curve illustrates this phenomenon. The particles where filters struggle include many viruses and bacteria, as well as particulate matter from wildfire smoke. These microscopic particles present two challenges. They're too small to be swept up in the in-room airflow and carried to the filters, or they are too small to be captured by the filter. GPS's patented needle point bipolar ionization technology works in concert with HVAC systems and their filters. Our devices deliver ions into indoor spaces, imparting a negative or positive charge to particles that attract them to one another, making them larger. Third-party testing was conducted in large chambers combining industry-adopted test configurations developed by ASHRAE and the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers and following scientific protocols. 
smoke from calibrated cigarettes was used as the particulate type at six air changes per hour, with ion densities averaging between 8 to 9,000 per cc during the 40-minute period, as found in real-world environments. Filters were tested with ionization off and on. After 40 minutes and four air changes in the chamber, MERV-10 filters plus NPVI achieved a removal efficiency that is comparable to HEPA-rated filters. The bottom line, HVAC filters with ionization offer faster and more thorough removal of the small particulates that are harmful to human health, helping solve for the MERV curve weak spot that most filters have, making indoor air quality better for everyone. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll share my, I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah, I just I released you. Yep. Hold on one second. Yeah, here's your screen, here's your email, here's your prezo. Okay. Should have full screen now. Okay. Okay. All righty. Yeah, full screen. Okay. So, um, we talked a little bit about the uh, indoor air quality in general and then uh, focusing on ionization. Now, before I start with anything, I always like to kind of talk about disclaimers that they, we do not promote uh, not following government guidelines. So whatever the guidelines happen to be at that time, whether it's masking up, increasing outside air, whatever it might be, let's follow those guidelines, okay? Now, Going back to before the pandemic, uh, and you can hear me fine, right? I just want to make sure of that. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have to say that being in the industry my whole life, I mean, my background, uh, you know, 40 plus years, I've worked for manufacturers like uh, Carrier. Um, you know, uh, the bulk of my career of 25 years was with York International and Johnson Controls, you know, because Johnson bought York. Um, and usually in the service department running offices for those companies. And one thing I always noticed was that, uh, you know, especially working in New York City, uh, no one really paid attention to indoor air quality pre-pandemic. Uh, diffusers were all discolored. Filters didn't get changed. Um, you know, I'd say that and maybe air balancing where things really got ignored because with air balancing, people would just do whatever the cheapest way possible to just sign off on air balancing, but it was never done correctly. Um, but, you know, again, not real important. So uh, all people looked at was, hey, we got to meet the minimum outside air requirements. Um, and, you know, maybe if we're going to monitor anything, we watch out with CO2. Typical filters in a building were MERV 8 or less. Um, then people were starting to focus a little more and some, and, you know, some of these cities like New York, uh, they have strict, strict regulations on lowering carbon footprints. Um, so people were starting to look at maybe doing more outside air reduction, things like that. But really, very little was done to measure the quality of inside air other than CO2. Now, when you talk about outside air, you know, we all have our, our phones that, uh, you know, we all have the weather app, right? And we can, um, you know, look to see what the weather's like outdoors, what the air quality is. But, you know, ironically, you know, we spend most of our, our time indoors and we have no idea what the quality of the air indoors is. I mean, outdoors, you can, you can you know, measure, uh, you know, air, there's an air quality index and there's like a, a rating system based on particulate in air and different things that will say whether uh, the air is good quality, you know, so-so or, or hazardous, let's say on the extreme case. Um, it's a zero to 500 yardstick they use. Um, so that exists for outside air, but inside air, no one's really cared about. You know, during the pandemic, 
things did change somewhat. I mean, kind of, you know, it was kind of like a shock to all of us. Uh, I don't think any of us saw this coming. Um, so all of a sudden, the initial guidelines we got was, oh, just flood the spaces with outside air. Uh, in, in the beginning, they were like, you know, people who are not in the industry, they just said, oh, HEPA filters, HEPA filters. They, they didn't realize that you can't, you can't just throw a HEPA filter into your typical uh, air handling unit uh, or package unit. Um, they just can't, just can't be done. Um, but then they finally got a little bit and they said, hey, MERV 13, try for MERV 13. Even MERV 13, you know, a lot of these systems can't accommodate that, uh, creates other issues with the system if it wasn't designed for that. Not to mention that at the time, they, it, they became hard to get and the prices got jacked up significantly. Um, people started using portable filtration units in space with HEPA filters in some cases, especially schools. Uh, UV lighting, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna touch on all of this. UV lighting, probably more sold than ever before. Ionization, again, you know, just like we did, you know, more sold than ever before. And then a lot of other technologies that, uh, that are around out there. So, you know, all of a sudden from spending nothing on these things to, you know, the, I'll say the, someone opened the spigot up and people were spending a ton of money on all these different products. Now, indoor air quality, the capability is there to measure indoor air quality. It's just that no one really has it yet. I do believe that in the future, I'll probably be retired by the time it happens, but I think that there's going to be a, a dashboard that people are going to use to know the quality of the space because that's where you spend most of your time. It's not outdoors, it's indoors. So I, I do think this is a this is a snapshot of a company called Senseware that has uh, you know uh, that that monitors indoor air quality, you know, particulates, CO2, mold, a lot of different different things can be measured with this system, and there are others out there as well. Now, the, the common solutions that were being used, I mean, HEPA filters, listen, HEPA filters, any air that goes through a HEPA filter is going to come out clean. All right, HEPA filters do a fantastic job. Filtration in general, you know, when people talk about different uh, indoor air quality, uh, you know, uh, systems that are being sold out there, whether it's ionization or something else, first off, if anyone's saying that whatever they, they are selling you is going to take the place of filtration, you really want to run the other way. The foundation of any HVAC system, it should be, it should start with adequate air movement, adequate ventilation, and at, at least adequate filtration. So whatever you can do starting at that point, that should always be the starting point. Um, HEPA filters, like I was saying, they do a great job cleaning anything that gets through them, that comes up to them. Unfortunately, if you, you know, most HVAC systems cannot be outfitted with HEPA filters. I mean, you, you wind up having to replace the entire HVAC system and it's just not cost effective. So then the other alternative is you go with portable units in a space. And sometimes there are other issues with that, that they're too noisy, they're in the way, they're very expensive, you know. So, but again, they work fantastic. Uh, ultraviolet, ultraviolet light, UV, okay. If that light shines on something, usually if you're talking viruses, things like that, it will, bacteria, it will kill it, okay? Now, a virus technically is not a living thing, but people use that expression, so I'll use it. But if that light shines on something directly on it long enough, it will take care of that. The problem is that what I saw happening, because UV has its place, it definitely does, okay? Um, and if you utilize it correctly, you know, it can help you tremendously. The thing is that People were still specifying UV the same way that they were pre-pandemic, thinking it was helping with these viruses. If the viruses are in the air flying by a couple of light bulbs, it's really not going to do anything. Um, so you need to increase. I'm not here to sell UV lights, but if you're going to do it, you need to need to have a longer bank of lights uh, in the system. Okay, so what you the way you designed it typically in the past is not really helping with if you're trying to address of viruses coming through the air handler. Now, ionization, uh, the thing that's different about ionization is uh, you're trying to get the ions to the space. And uh, so you're dressing, you're, you're dressing the particulates in the space. And all you're really doing is you're creating positive and negative uh, charge that will create ions, positive and negative. And, and ions are something that exist 
in nature. So it's not it's not something that you know it's not out there. I'll be going into that a little bit on future slides. Now this is on in 2020, and, and I I had my reservations about even using this slide because frankly it's it's outdated already, and it's really not correct. But I, I just wanted to, you to see is what happened between 2019 and 2020 uh, in terms of uh, people buying different indoor air quality systems, uh, whether it be look at you know HEPA, you know a lot of portable HEPA filters were sold. Forty percent of this pie chart. A UV, 25%, ionization, 20%, and other technologies, 15%. You see, it went from, this is billions of dollars, not millions. It went from two and a half to nine and a half billion dollars. And I think these consultants that put this together were assuming that it was going to keep growing. But frankly, now we're back somewhere in between pre-pandemic and, you know, the uh, tremendous growth that took place in 2020. So I just wanted to kind of I wanted to show this, but I wanted to make sure I spell that out because this was a projection that, frankly, has fallen way short. I'm going to skip this because this is more of the same as far as that goes. So when we talk about ionization, and specifically our company does what we call needlepoint bipolar ionization, the um, thing I want to make clear, it's not like we're just creating something that doesn't exist in nature. Uh, ions are everywhere around us. You have ions around you right now, uh, especially when you take a shower. You're you're flooded with ions because running water creates ions. Um, so ions exist in nature, and usually the nicer the environment, the cleaner the environment, the more ions you tend to have. So out in the woods, out at the beach, things like that, you have high, very high ion counts. It just kind of shows you know, what you could see outdoors versus indoors. You know, outdoors, it's not, you know, in a very clean environment, it's not it's not a strange thing to see tens of thousands of ions. Uh, when I was up by Niagara Falls, because obviously it's a lot of moving water, um, you know, I had my, the ion counts I took with my meter uh, were huge compared to even this, this higher bar on the chart. I was like several times over this. Um, in a space, this slide shows, oh, you know, 2000s, frankly, on the high end that you find in a space, like in a city environment, as usually I'm, I'm measuring the hundreds, not even the thousand. All we're doing is using voltage to electrically charge the air molecules that are going by an air handler. So again, systems that we're selling, they go in an ex existing air handlers and you're using, you need to have air movement for these systems to work, okay? Our company has been in business since 2008. Um, and really the only thing we do is indoor air quality, ionization, that's all we do. We don't make fans, we don't make, uh, you know, uh, air handlers, we don't make, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, chillers, none of that. We just, it's just strictly uh, ionization products. And again, in business since 2008. Now, I want to show a little bit of a difference because uh, ionization has been around a long time, but not necessarily needlepoint bipolar ionization. And uh, there, the terminology has been changing a little bit in that um, I'll say uh, the old style, you know, with the tube that uh, that that uh, that sort of ionization, not needlepoint ionization, is now being referred to as hard ionization because it actually is at a higher uh, higher energy and uh, breaks uh, these these uh, chemical bonds apart, okay? Um, and that's what this slide, slide is basically showing. You're still creating positive and negative, but you're breaking things apart, which has the potential to create ozone. Uh, we specifically were created, our founder, Charlie Waddell, uh, worked for a company that did hard ionization and knew about the, the potential for, for creating ozone and knew if he could come up with a way to, uh, to uh, ionize the air without creating ozone, you know, he'd have a really good product. And that's basically what he did. So it's lower energy that's just attaching to each electron, both positive and negative. And then, you know, that expression opposites come together. All we're really doing is uh, positive, 
uh, particles are attracted to negative and they basically come together like magnets and the particles get big enough to get caught up in the airstream and caught up in filters. So this tall gentleman here, and he is that tall, he's about six foot six, Charlie Waddell, he is the founder of the company. Um, this is Dr. Sovic who's on our staff. Um, and what we're really trying to promote is multi-layered approach to indoor air quality. So you're working with the existing HVAC system, okay? Um, and we're helping those filters to work better, okay? It does not take the place. So if you're, if you're moving air, you can use our system, okay? If you're not moving air and you don't have filters and so on, then it's not, probably not a good idea. You need to get back to the basics first. Again, ventilation, filtration, air movement, those are the keys to start with. So oh, this is just an example how, you know, if you're moving air, you can apply our product for all kinds of different buildings, you know, whether it be a grow facility, uh, airports, office buildings, hospitals, schools, obviously is a huge part of our market. Larry, sorry if I can just interrupt yeah. you. The last slide, you um, your, your audio for some reason uh, uh, pooped out. So, but anyway, just continue. Okay. When you're choosing products, indoor air quality products, one thing that, uh, you know, like ASHRAE does not recommend that you go with ionization. They're not going to come out and do that, at least not yet. Um, but what they do say is if you can use indoor air quality products, uh, you really want to make sure that you've got you know, UL2998 uh, certification, which basically means that you don't make ozone. Okay. It basically means you make less than five parts per billion. So we have that on all of our products, not some of our products, all of them. Uh, we, uh, we are actually, uh, tagging a VPA stamp on our products. We have, uh, RPCA, which, uh, is not really related to air as much as it is, uh, just saying that our devices do not create any harmonics, any, any line noise that could, uh, create havoc in a machine room or a computer room. Uh, we don't create on those. And obviously it's a real issue with aircraft, right? You don't want to, you know, that's why they make us put everything on airplane mode. And then CE is just because our products are sold in in Europe, and that's a, that's a standard you need to you need to you know work with uh, in Europe. Now I'm going to harp on the two nine nine eight certification because it is so important. Um, again, uh, it's you know ASHRAE, CDC, EPA. The the guidelines they have is that if you're going to use products like this, you want to make sure you're two nine nine eight certified, and all of our products are certified and they are certified with UL, okay? There are people that'll say that, well, we've tested our products with a different lab and we've, uh, you know, and maybe one of their products might've passed some certification with another lab and they'll say that they're certified and it's like, well, okay, it's not with UL and it's not also not all the products. Every one of our products is UL2998 certified with UL. And you can pull that up here on this slide I show. There is a website there, it's a UL spot website if you go to that website and you type in the, the name of our company, all of our products will show up there, okay? I will tell you that most of our competitors that make those claims, they're not on that site anywhere. Now, to give you an idea of part per billion, this is an example of, well, basically, uh, you know, one part per billion is equivalent of like a milliliter and, a one, well, one one millionth of a, of a milliliter. So it's the equivalent of, if you had an Olympic sized swimming pool, see how big that pool is. And it's like having, you know, 15 to 20 drops from a little, you know, little eyedropper. And uh, that gives you some perspective there. All right, so it's really very, very low. You have other devices that you're around all the time that frankly create more ozone than that. Uh, commercial printers, uh, your, your screen, <laughs> your, your big computer screen, things like that are all creating more than that, all right? So, um, you know, how does our, our, how do our systems work? Uh, again, it's that if you want to call it a snowball effect, but it's positive particles coming together with negative particles because we've charged these things and they, they wind up tacking together and getting larger and larger. Now, really everything in the air is a particle. You know, everything is something, you know, molecules are particles, just very small. Atoms are even smaller than that, but everything's a particle. You can't see it, but it's a particle. Even viruses are particles. So that's one way you're addressing 
all particles of air, a particulate, because that's what you really need to do. When you think about it, you're removing particulate from the air. That's what you're doing with, with filters. You have a mesh on these filters, and depending on how tight the mesh on these filters is, you can get smaller and smaller particles out of the air. Okay, so we're helping those filters to work better. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, everything, odors like smoke, all that stuff, these are all particles. And this, this slide just kind of shows all the different uh, particles that are in there that you can't really see. But when you get to viruses, there's another way we address viruses. We've all seen on the TV, we're all sick of it, uh, but the spike protein, okay? This is a uh, you know, coronavirus as an example. And a lot of these viruses look this very similar, flu virus looks similar, but this spike protein, the outer membrane, okay? Um, when a charge hits that, which is what you do with ionization. We're sending these, ion, these ionized particles out into the uh, space. And when it makes contact with these viruses, these viruses become inactive. They're not really dead theoretically because it's not a living thing in the first place. But it, what it does is it disrupts the surface protein to where the, these, these viruses cannot replicate. And that's the way, you know, if you want to use the word, if it was a living thing, you'd say reproduce, but it's actually replication. So that will not take place anymore. And that's what gets you sick because it gets in your lungs and it grows and it grows because you know we're, we're the host and that's what happens. So, so it addresses viruses two ways, like a particle, but also by inactivating virus itself. Now this slide here, I don't really, I tend not to look at the surface testing so much anymore because what they've been finding is that we've been getting sick off of what's in the air. It's usually aerosol, version of a virus that gets coughed or sneezed or breathed out into the space. And uh, you see that the uh, findings, I mean, were that really tremendous reduction. Now, granted, this is in a laboratory. I will say that the last tests were in 20 by 10 by 8 chamber. Uh, so not, you know, not a small chamber. Each time the testing was done, it was done in larger and larger chambers. So you see that a great, it was reduced tremendously. Real world, Maybe not quite as efficient, but you know, it's going to do something, all right? So uh, again, tested in a large chamber. And also good with like, you know, flu, RSV, which is huge now. RSV is this virus you've probably been seeing on the news that uh, a lot of children are winding up in the hospitals right now. Um, and earlier than normal, because normally this doesn't start to happen until January or February, and usually nowhere near the levels that we're seeing right now. Uh, doctors don't really know what's causing it. They don't know if it's after effects from having had COVID or something, but, um, and it's usually a combination of other things as well. It could be the flu, it could be cold, all these things combined together. But some of the hospitals, especially I know in New England have been getting overwhelmed with children, you know, under 10 years old, most of them, you know, infants, like, you know, just a, you know, a couple of years old. So there's a lot of that going on right now. So again, it works with all these viruses, it helps. And that's the whole idea is to make things better. And volatile organic compounds, again, is just stuff in the air, okay? The stuff that's off gas from, could be furniture, you know, cleaning products, all this stuff. The whole idea is get as many of these particles out of the air as possible. And again, I always say everything's a particle. So post-pandemic. You know, what, what, what should we be doing? And again, everything always starts with the foundation of, you know, proper ventilation, adequate ventilation, uh, filtration, okay? And what can we do to either upgrade the filters or make those filters work better? Okay, so that's what we are looking. Now, we also, in some cases, those of you who are consulting engineers, you have a tug of war going on, right? Because um, you might have some clients that are like, well, you know, we start introducing more outside air and our, our utility bills are through the, loop, they're through the roof. And in some cases, in some cities like New York and Boston, it's like they have these regulations where they're supposed to lower the carbon footprints by such and such date. And last time I checked, it's kind of hard to do that when you're bringing in more outside air. It's the equivalent of leaving a door or a window open you know, at home and then expecting the utility bills to go down, that's not gonna happen. So you have that tug of war going on. Um, now, regardless of whether you're using more or less outside air, 
probably a good idea to have less particulate in that air. You know, I, I think that uh, someday in the future, uh, we're going to be monitoring all of this and, uh, you know, and we'll have an idea of whether we have high or low particulate because when we just blindly say, hey, increase or decrease outside air, if we don't know the quality of that air versus what's inside, we don't know what we're accomplishing. If the air outside, let's say the intake of that air handler is near a loading dock or something, and we're just bringing in fumes, are we improving the quality of the air by bringing more outside air? No, we're not. So all of that needs to be taken into account. So again, a layered approach works best. I, you know, I'm always going to say I'm going to keep coming back to ventilation and air movement because if you're not moving there, you're not getting anything up to the filters. Okay, adequate filtration, and then layering in additional air cleaning, possibly needle point bipolar ionization, possibly something else you might want to use. But, you know, again, a multi-layered approach. Whatever we do, we should be trying to do something to help clean up the air. Now, um, the slide is a little outdated. I'd like to probably update it again at the end of the year, but um, go back to the office. Now, I don't know how much of your work you all are doing, like in Philadelphia, as an example. Um, I know in New York, because I spend a lot, I, I live outside New York City. Um, when I go in the city still, it's, it's amazing during the week, a lot of these office buildings are still, I get just not great turnout in the offices, okay? I think people realize they can work remote. Uh, and, you know, a typical person that works in Manhattan, you know, commuting an hour and a half each way to work, so yeah, any excuse not to have to go in is a good thing, right? But yet what I found was, and you can see on the chart here, you know, uh, NBA games, 95% of, of the occupancy that they normally have at the games, open table dinner reservations, that's that app for um, dinner reservations. I can tell you Manhattan, I've stayed at hotels there and can't get a reservation at the restaurants I want to go to. But yet when I go to these office buildings, they're more than half empty. Okay, and this is what's been going on. I do think there's been an uptick like in September uh, and October. Um, but again, still very, you know, still very sparse when you compare it to the, the occupancy rates pre-pandemic, okay? This slide here, which you'll see Philadelphia here at the bottom of the list here, and intend to put Philadelphia at the bottom, it's just the way the list was. Um, but this was uh, August 3rd, for example, 38.2% of the occupancy that they were monitoring pre-pandemic. I mean, that's probably, you know, just in the city, when you get in the suburbs, the numbers tend to be higher percentage occupancy. And I'm sure those numbers have up, like I said, September, uh, there was more, there were more and more news reports of more people coming back to the office. Now, relatively recently, we, uh, we did, have a third party conduct some more testing for specifically uh, with regards to particulate. Um, and uh, you saw on that video uh, where they used smoke in that chamber. And it's, it's, it's meant to show uh, how we can improve the way your existing filters work in the system by introducing ionization. You know, certain size airborne particles are not that easily filtered by the indoor air systems of filtration. Doesn't mean that, you know, not to use them. Again, it just shows there's a weak spot. And by using uh, NPBI can improve the way those filters will work. Now this chart here, I like about this chart, this shows, now all the way on the right, that's a human hair, okay? So that's, you know, this is just to show you perspective-wise on the different sizes of different particles. Now, when you talk about that weak spot, which is below one micron, that's where wildfire smoke is, coronavirus, and a lot of other viruses as well are in that size range. So you see that they happen to be in the weak spot and look how small they are as compared to human hair or as compared to a grain of sand, which is you know the next one on the upper end there. So it gives you a perspective on how small things are relative to each other. Now going back to what I said early on, you know, we, we monitor our air outside. A lot of people who have allergies, asthma, things like that, they're always looking at the outside air, but we spend 90% of our time indoors. And, you know, we breathe 20,000 breaths per day and 440 cubic feet of air daily. 
And there can be as many as 18 to 20 million airborne particles in a single cubic feet of air. So if you start doing the math, it gets really crazy. And 99.9% .9 of the particles are below the one micron size. So probably makes sense to try to address that. And that stuff you know, comes out of the ASHRAE handbook. Uh, <clears throat> this chart here shows um, how, you know, you, we have protection built into our bodies, okay? Uh, larger particles, um, you know, assume let's say we're not wearing a mask and uh, nose hair, mucous membranes. Um, and then when you get further down here, you got cilia that they're almost like tentacles that help prevent things from going into your lung passages. But then smaller and smaller stuff can get deeper and deeper into your lungs. And the items that are below one micron can go way deep down into your lungs. And that's what causes a lot of issues with people like COPD and different things. So a uh, good idea to address that if you can. So it would be a good idea if we can measure how much contaminants actually been removed from a space and how fast you can remove it. And that's, that was part of the reason for this testing. Um, in the real world, the job of air cleaning is never done because you're always introducing, there's always more stuff coming into the space. A person walks by, I mean, it's crazy, the particulate generating the air just, just by what flakes off of our bodies, it's crazy. Uh, hidden pollutants, off-gassing chemicals, furniture, all this stuff um, degrade the indoor air quality. So that MERV curve, I think they showed it briefly on that video you saw. Now, regardless of what um, filter you're using, okay, so this is a different MERV. And if you look at like, uh, you know, most buildings use eight, which is this red line, okay? And you see this huge dip. That's just not being, you know, I'm sorry, the red line down here of what's not being covered. And then MERV 13 is the dotted um, green line, okay? Better, obviously, but still has a weak spot. Now, uh, HEPA would be the equivalent. I think HEPA is a 17 and higher, okay, to be considered a HEPA filter. You have to be a minimum of 17 MERV rating. This goes, this chart goes up to 16, okay, which is the gray line. You see, they all have the weak spot. And we all, we all know that it's not practical to get to, Mer, uh, excuse me, HEPA on most air handlers. Now, again, the shaded area shows the uh, wildfire smoke, which is meant to simulate particles sub one micron, okay? Viruses, that sort of thing. So that's the whole reason for using smoke because it falls into that particle range. And you know, with that, I'll say also, you know, we all, we're getting the, guide, the guidance on wearing masks and so forth, you know, um, Viruses are smaller than smoke particles. So if you want to test a, max, a, a, a mask you have, if you can breathe smoke through it, it's, you know, it's uh, not, the, that mask is not as good as you, what you might think. So you might want to rethink double layering if you ever get back to that point again. Hopefully we never go there. But, um, so the test was done by a company called Blue Heaven Technologies, which is a company that are, part of what they do, they do a lot of testing, but part of what they do is, they conduct testing for the filtration industry. Okay, so they have a chamber that was set up for this. It's not like they had to set it up just for us. Okay, this is a 10 by 10 by 10 uh, chamber. And it's, you know, it's uh, basically A2LA accredited, you know, chamber, AHEM standard size, um, ASH rate 52.2. Uh, so again, not done specifically for us. The difference was that we wanted to introduce um ionization into the process okay using calibrated cigarettes to simulate the particle size that's in that range that typically is not picked up very well by the filters okay so that was the whole idea is to be in the sub one micron range and uh and then basically compare the two that's all it is simple you know the chamber as you can see the blue the blue line is the, the actual test loop the green loop is a loop they use between tests for flushing the chamber. That's all that is. And, you know, in four air changes, look at the difference here. You know, um, this is, this is uh, you know, without, and this is with 
organization. So pretty drastic different difference. And again, it's all about particles. It's not just about viruses, because a lot of people say, well, the virus is over. Well, what about cleaning the air? Okay, and that's what this is all about, is cleaner air. So um, we want to achieve the, the best indoor air quality that we can, and it should be a continuous process. And we should be measuring particulate. Again, filters are a good start, right? If you can improve the filtration, great. Um, but if you add needle point to that, you're enhancing that, that much more. You're enhancing the amount of particulate that's getting removed, which is should be the goal. Now, um, I'm gonna skip this because I'm gonna show at the end, I have, I have, I have it at the bottom of my uh, bar here that I can share. Um, um, we have different tools that are designed for engineers, and I'm gonna go into that. What I wanna go next is, uh, is how you apply these different products. Because we have different products for different applications, depending on where you're mounting the device. And what I'm gonna say, the very basic thing with ionization, the closer you get to the space, the better off you are, okay? Uh, ions typically, because when they hit something, they discharge and they become, they become part of a bigger particle, um, you know, gonna last a minute or less. So you wanna spend 30 seconds or less getting to the space. So we have different products for different application. Like in this case, this first product, and yeah, I should spell out, this HVAC system here is just, this is just for uh, illustration purposes because you're not gonna have an HVAC system as a VA, VAV trunk and a constant volume uh, you know, uh, trunk on the same unit, okay? So this is just for illustration, illustration purposes. But if you're, you have this iMod product, which is a bar that, you know, it's, it's modular. So you snap the pieces together to get the required length to cover the upper portion of a coil and keep that coil clean, but also to help with odors coming in from the outdoors. And um, that product, again, it's meant specifically for that. So we don't recommend that for getting uh, products down, for getting ions downstream, because you're far away and you're going through a coil and you're gonna lose a ton of ions going through the coil, okay? Also, with all of our products, you want to be after the filters, okay? Because filters also, you'll lose a lot of ions going through there. Now this next product here, the uh, FC24 and FC48, um, if this air handler was, let's say directly on the roof and the air was going directly down into the space without you know long runs of ductwork or whatever, you could use this uh, next to the fan housing and get the ions down to the space. Or if you have fan coil units in the space, ideal product for that, okay? So again, always wanna get closer if you can. Now, if you've got longer runs of duct, first thing you might wanna do is these duct mount units, a DM48. Again, with all these products, they're rated in terms of CFM. The DM48, for instance, is for, rated for 4,800 CFM. If you have higher CFM, you simply add more product, okay? Again, Closer to the space, the better. Um, if you get even closer um, down the line, we have another duct mount unit that has a lower rating on it, but it's uh, it can be mounted after VAB box or just before the first diffusers. Um, but when you do that, when you, as you're getting closer, then you'll wind up mounting more devices. So you always have to weigh that out whether, again, the best is always to be as close as possible you know, right before that first diffuser, that is the best. If you can't do that, you go back and say, okay, I'll go with these duct mounted units upstream. And if you can't do that, then at the unit. So it's kind of good, better, best. Now, in the case of these smaller duct mount units and these particular ones, like these up here, the, the DM48 can be indoors or outdoors. DM2 is strictly an indoor product. And if you're on a duct coming off a VAV box many times, you transition to smaller round duct, and sometimes to mount that, you use all the way in the bottom right-hand corner here, there's this adjustable sleeve that uh, will, will help, will flex around the round duct for mounting purposes, okay? 
Hey, Jim, I've been rambling on for a long time here. I just want to make sure I haven't lost you all. No, you're still uh, going strong. Okay. So um, now, product in the top, top right-hand corner here, and I'm going to show you some of these products when I'm done with the slide presentation, but that is our smallest auto, auto clean product. It's about the size of a deck of cards. It's a little bit thicker than a deck of cards. Now, all these products here, with the exception of the iMod, these other products I've shown you, all have wiper blades on them that wipe the tips and keep them clean. So it's a maintenance-free product. Now, you see with this GPS product, and I'll show you with my camera later, um, it basically, this mechanism goes back and forth to clean the tips rather than having a wiper blade on it. But it's still an auto-clean unit, and it is the smallest auto-clean unit that we make and the smallest one on the, on the market. So again, this picture of the duct mount unit, and I'm gonna show you these products a little bit later. Oh, let me go back on this. So these tips here, okay, these are carbon fiber brushes. They look almost like little paint brushes. And, and again, I'll show you on the camera, and you have this wiper blade that once a day is gonna go over the tips and wipe those tips clean. So it's a maintenance-free product. These brushes do not oxidize. They do not wear. They're carbon fiber. Um, and the, this mechanism does not need to be replaced. Nothing here needs to be replaced. Very important you know that because with some of the other products there, some of the other ionization products with these bulbs, you have to replace these bulbs every year and a half to two years, and they are very expensive, very expensive. So you need to take that into account. Now, um, it, if you want to possibly arrange a visit to come down to our headquarters, we have our design and engineering facility there. We have our own test chambers and we love showing that stuff off. So if you have a client or if any of your engineering firms, if any of you wanna come down there, you can make arrangements with HCNI and we will, you know, we'd be more than happy to have you down there We'd like to show off what we have because we like we want people to see that there's something behind all this. Okay, it's not all smoke and mirrors. Although one of the tests we'll do will be will be a smoke test that you could witness. Stop sharing for a minute there, but I'm, I want to some other things here that I would like to share. I'm going to share some of the tools. Well, you know what? Let me let me show some of the devices first. Why don't I do that? You can see me, right? Now, yes. This is the duct mount unit, which, uh, as you can see with all these devices, you got the wiper blade here, and these are the carbon fiber tips. All right, and this mounts right in a duct. You make a four-inch hole. You mount it. Now, with all of our products, I'm going to show you our website. But with all of our products, there's an installed video for every one of these. So it's aside from the manual and so forth. This is a video for every one of these. It makes it very, very easy to install these products. The smallest unit that I told you, I mean, again, the size of it's actually smaller than my iPhone. All right. It's the, the kind of the dimensions of a deck of cards, just a little bit thicker. And it has this mechanism that goes back and forth that cleans the tips rather than the blade. I'm going to share my screen again. Now we have a lot of tools on our site that I, hold on a second, old man issues here. Uh, but, but, but. You see my um, spreadsheet here? Yeah. Okay, so this is um, this is an IQ method for reducing outside air. Now we don't, we're not, frankly right now, we're not necessarily recommending people do this. And as a matter of fact, ASHRAE just went through an update. So actually this isn't even current right now. But just so you know, this is a tool that's out there. And if you ever want any training on using it, we can help you with that. 
And basically um, what it does is it, it's something you can use. Top line is what I'll call your, your standard method for calculating outside air. All right. And left-hand column here is, that, you know, you can choose different, um, you know, you can lower your outside air. And then when you look at it, you have all these different compounds. You don't want any of these things to get flagged. So if these things would build up when you reduce outside air or when you, let's say, in increase uh, activity, because like in this case, we use standing desk work as an example. And okay, nothing was flagged. Everything was green. And then if you go to the right, because the other thing you monitor with this is CO2. CO2 is still okay here. Versus, you know, you want to hit 5,000. You don't want to come close to that. So um, let's say, just to show you something quick, because this is like a lot of time just to train on this. But uh, again, more than happy to do that for you sometime. But let's say it was an aerobics class. All of a sudden, you got ammonia being pegged, uh, methylene chloride, and your, your CO2 went up that much more. So not a good idea to reduce there when you've got a situation like that. But that's just a, just a quick, uh, you know, wanted to show you that. Um, now the, um, I was talking earlier about getting as close to the space as possible in order to make sure you are getting ionization to the space. Now, what I will tell you, I'm, I'm a lazy guy, okay? And most of you probably aren't looking for extra work. But if you want to calculate how long it takes uh, to get the ions to the space, and all this is is, you know, a velocity calculator, okay? And this, you know, the instruction that now it, it's, a, it's a sheet that works with green, orange, red. You don't want red, obviously. You want to very least get to orange, which means that you're getting, orange means you're getting to the space within 30 seconds. Green means you're getting there within 20 seconds. That's all that means. And once you have your, uh, once you put in your, you start off with the velocity, if you know the CFM and you know the dimensions, for starters, you're going to know, okay, or is the velocity going to fall in line? And then let's just do a quick constant volume. Um, in the case of this, okay, uh, 29 seconds, which is under the 30, so you're in the orange, you're okay. If it was a shorter run of duct, let's say, I don't know. You see that, oh, it got to the space in 13 seconds, so green light on it, okay? So this will help you with that, but what I can tell you is that typically when... Um, Typically, when you're you're designing systems, if you're doing constant volume, guy a good guideline to use is 500 feet um, away or less. Um, if you're doing uh, you know variable air volume, probably 125 feet or less, and that's assuming you're cranking all the way down to 25 percent. Obviously, if you're only cranking down 50 percent or something like that, then it's somewhere in between. But those are just some guidelines because people ask me that sometimes and. Uh, I know people don't aren't looking for extra work, so I, I give them those guidelines. But just know you have that tool there if you want to use it. Um, just uh, Larry, sorry if I can just interrupt. So there's a question sort of related to just the uh, topic that you just uh, uh, covered. So if I can just ask it and yeah. then we'll continue on. I know you have a couple sure. other uh, calculators to show. Sure. So um, uh, last year, a, a consulting engineer was told by another uh, air ionization manufacturer that the unit should be mounted as close to the room as possible because the ions have a limited lifespan. Is this accurate? Yes, that's the closer the better. So, and that, and that's basically what we're suggesting. So if you can, and you know, it's again, good, better, best, right? If you want to get the highest ion count, you want to be right before that first diffuser, right? But if you can't, if it's not convenient or just hard to do the installation, maybe be a little further away. Um, but that's going to have a lot to do with which one of these products you select. So yes, closer, closer is better. 
Okay. Yep. The question was asked when you showed the, uh, you know, the cutaway view of an HVAC system with the different location of the uh, air ionizer. So yeah. So, so, anyway, so I just wanted to, um, sorry, uh, cut, cut, not cut you off, but just while yeah. it was fresh in everybody's mind. So if you can continue on with the uh, master spec, et cetera, like that. Yeah. So, but again, on that subject, you know, when you talk about mounting the devices, you want to be as close as possible and after all filters, because another thing you don't want to do, I've, I've seen where people put it in and it was in a hospital setting and there was a HEPA filter all the way at the end of the line before this room. And I said, well, if you're trying to accomplish, you know, ionization in the space, nothing's going to get through that HEPA filter. So, you, you know, don't, if you're doing it for that specific sp space, don't do that. Okay. So again, after filters as far downstream as possible. Um, yeah. Uh, and again, these different things that I'm pulling up are all on our, our website that HC Nye can share with you. Okay, so another one is like master spec is a, is a big one. Okay, and again, it's, it's on our website and, and uh, HC Nye will share that with you. And uh, where is it? I'm not seeing it. Hold on a second. I get rid of some of these other things. Okay, let's see now. See that? Yeah. So this is a master spec. Sorry for that. I just was I had so many things open. I just uh, should have cleaned a lot of that out. But so th there's a link there that um, the HC and I can share with you, and it's it's master spec. Each one of our products has its own master spec, thin master spec, and uh, you know you'll probably find that helpful. It's, that way you don't have to reinvent the wheel whenever you're laying anything out. It's all there for you. And uh, what I'll show you too is that um, so on our website, you can you can see that right now. Yes. Okay. So uh, under engineering tools, you know, normally you would click on that and you open it up, and there are a lot of nice little tools in here. That you might find helpful, and, and one of them is this, this master spec. And again, HC and I can share that with you. And all you do is you you, know, you click on this, and hopefully you'll be able to see it. And uh, well, I guess it's not allowing me to do it online, but you'll be able to get to that master spec for each product. You just click on it, and it'll take you right in there. And then you can go for that product. And again, master spec for each one. Um, as I was saying earlier, there's uh, videos, install videos for every product is listed under here. Um, test reports, if you want to share that with anyone. Um, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff there that, you, you know, this, this, the data sheets, which is, you know, spec sheet, basically, manuals, all that. But like I said, the video, I think, is the best because uh, that way, even a technician mounting this thing could be on the roof and looking at it on their phone and walks them right through the installation process. So that's, uh, now we have the sales toolkit. Uh, you can see this, right? And basically, again, this is something, this is great for contractors. And a lot of these links that are on the website are on this one document. So Jim can share that with you. And uh, so by just having that saved, you can click on all these documents that are right in the 
body of this, what we call sales toolkit. So it'll take you to anything you might want, whether it's IAQ, whether it's videos, whether it's all here in this one document. So uh, you might find that very helpful. Uh, and that's uh, basically all I got, uh, Jim. Okay, great. Great job, Larry. Appreciate it. Um, so we have another question that has come in. So let me just pull that up and ask it. Um, so the question is, <coughs> excuse me, how do you guarantee that the ion particles make their way back to the filters in the HVAC equipment? You mentioned proper velocity of air in spaces and the test chamber diagram uh, shows a low return. But what about if the ceiling return, the, the returns are at the ceiling uh, or in existing systems. It seems that the ions and particles that join could be large enough to fall out of the airstream and fall onto surfaces of the space. And well, then therefore be picked up from vacuuming, cleaning, et cetera. Yeah, and, and sometimes that is some of what will happen, but the whole idea is to get it out of the breathing zone. You don't want that particulate at the breathing level, okay, because that's where it's going to harm us. You want it to either get up into the into the system, into the return, and into the filters, or on the surfaces where they could be cleaned up. But you don't want them, um, you don't want them in the breathing zone. You want to you want to clean that air that you're breathing. But you are correct. If I can just uh, interrupt uh, anecdotally, what we found is that once you put in the uh, air ionization, you end up getting uh, a lot of particles removed. And so therefore, like you described, Jared, these spaces get covered with dust and then the filters, instead of being changed every three months, they have to sort of be immediately uh, changed. So after, after that first initial run and cleaning is done, then it sort of, uh, you know, settle, settles down or just, uh, you know, the, the majority of particles have been uh, removed. Yeah, I, I've had a, a couple of cases that I can, uh, I can tell you that I personally, like when I installed the product in my home, the first time changing the filters, uh, the filters almost looked like, you know what the screen looks like when you clean out your dryer? <laughs> it, there was a lot that stuck together there the first time. Uh, the other thing is uh, we had a call from a customer in New York actually, where um, they said, oh, something's wrong. You, you know, they, they, they called us in and, and turned out that uh, they had a, a lot of printers set up in this one room. And it turned out that there must have been a lot of, I'll say, printer dust, you know, ink or whatever that was in the air that um, they noticed when they moved some things off a shelf that was nearby that there was an outline of, let's say, this stack of paper that was sitting there and they took it away. You could see the outline because thing, this dust was settling on the shelving and so forth. And, you know, and some of it was going in the filters and some of it was going in the, but again, that stuff that they were breathing in before. So that's that's it doing that's it's supposed to do that. You want to get it out of the air you're breathing. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, another question: Are there any independent studies that are peer reviews peer reviewed on needlepoint bipolar ionization in general? Well, there's there are plenty of tests that have been done in terms of peer reviewed. Actually, we do have some in process that are going to be that are going to be peer reviewed that are are in that process. Okay, there are third party party tests out there. Okay, and uh, again, yes, we did have to pay for those tests, but there were you know companies like UL, companies like that, uh, which even UL, a lot of people don't realize you have to pay for that. Um, so that that has been done. We've also had tests of specific sites that we can share uh, where they've done their own testing. You know, whether it be I have a hospital, uh, office buildings. Um, that have been tested before and after so people can see the improvement. Um, and it's, this is all going to happen in time, frankly. It, uh, you know, but yes, it's, it's, it's happening. Okay, another one has come in. Um, does the uh, static pressure have any bearing on the needlepoint bipolar effectiveness? Uh, no, not, no. Basically, all you know, airflow and velocity. Yeah, no, not not an issue. Okay. But what it what, what will happen though when you talk about that velocity? Think about this: the higher the velocity, the less time it takes the ions to get to the space. So it does have an effect on, you know, if you have more velocity, you get to the space faster. So in theory, you could have higher ion count downstream. 
Okay. And then uh, there isn't a question on this, but I know that I've been personally asked a, a few times this in the field, uh, just, you know, seen online or have customers that have seen online, um, you know, GPS being uh, sued, uh, lawsuits, et cetera, like that. If you would, uh, if you could share any updates on that. Yeah. So um, uh, basically, I'm glad you asked the question because uh, things are uh, things are are happening. So uh, first off, I want to make sure people are aware of that because there are a lot of people that think that we've got all these lawsuits against us, which is not true. First off, and then they say, "Oh, this is class action lawsuit." I was like, "Well, yes and no." There's one lawsuit against us. It's called a putative class action, which means they're trying to they're trying to they're trying to get it to be a class action lawsuit. It's one person with his law with his lawyers, okay? And it was based on some other I'll say studies that were done, things that were put out on, online that led them to believe that uh, our product could potentially be dangerous or just doesn't work or whatever it might be, and. Most of it's already been thrown out. Now, what has happened is the people who, let's say, uh, did some targeted, uh, I'll say, um, negative press towards us, and it was very much, you know, it was very, a very aggressive campaign. It turned out that someone who was kind of saying that they were almost like an independent uh, person was actually being paid by one of our competitors to start a negative campaign against us. And uh, that case is starting November 28th, okay? So that is, uh, and I don't think that's something that should be dragging on for very long, but, uh, you know, the one lawsuit wouldn't have existed with some of this, the stuff this other, these other people put out there. So we felt it was necessary to go after the people that put some of the false narrative out there. So um, that's where that's at. And like I said, November 28th is not that far away. And I'm I'm very happy that we're finally going to be able to put that behind us because once that's resolved, the other thing is just going to is just going to disappear. Most of it's already thrown out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we're uh, at 108. There's no more questions uh, coming in. Um, just what I'll will uh, what I'll do is uh, just you know now for a, sort of a final summary. Um, you know, just uh, what we'll provide afterwards is sort of a, a, a final packet that we'll send out uh, a link for the recording. We'll clean up or just send out the question and answers. Um, as I mentioned before, if you could take the time to complete the survey uh, and send it in, it's always very helpful to us. Thank you for attending. Uh, we can issue PDH credits uh, for this presentation. Just uh, send myself or Gianna Salvatore a uh, email for that. And then uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, GPS uh, does have a CEU approved uh, presentation uh, that we could uh, you know, set up with your customers or set up with you guys as you see fit, just let us know. And then the other uh, few things that we'll send out in that final packet that Larry uh, touched on or the you know, master spec, we'll send like a link to their website, <coughs> obviously and then some of those other uh, calculation spreadsheets. All right, so still uh, no questions. So uh, once again, thanks everybody. We'll just hang on for another minute or two just to see if anything uh, trickles in. Um, thank you once again for uh, attending. Uh, just a reminder, today is November 8th for uh, election day. And then, um, you know, have a happy holidays with November and, and uh, New Year, uh, Christmas, et cetera, like that, around that time. And then we'll have, a ne our next webinar will be on uh, Tuesday, January 24th. It's probably gonna be on uh, cold climate, air source heat pumps, focus on Aon. So uh, once again, thank you everybody for uh, attending. Um, I'll just keep it open for another couple minutes here in case a question does come in. Thank you once again.